National Police Force Band. Pro Chancellor, today's feature address is being done by Dr. Bibi Arifa Aladdin. Dr. Aladdin is a Barbitian born to a family of rice farmers, the third of four children, and was raised on the west coast of Babis in a small village called Number Three. There she pursued her primary education at Cotton Tree and later on the New Amsterdam Multilateral School where she graduated and having been acclaimed the best graduating science student, having earned a distinction in chemistry, the first for the New Amsterdam Multilateral School. It was from multi, as it's popularly called here, that she journeyed to Turkine University of Guyana, where she began a program of studies leading to qualifications in the discipline of pharmacy. Given her assiduity and discipline, she graduated with a distinction in pharmacy, even still being a teenager. At that time, she was the youngest graduate and went, in, went on to practice as a pharmacist. But shortly thereafter, she came into contact with a very distinguished and insightful individual who currently serves the university as the dean and the faculty of health sciences, Dr. Emmanuel Cummins, who may have seen something and encouraged in fact, demanded that she moved to a path that would take her to the School of Medicine to permit her to be trained and qualified as a physician. In her own words, she felt that that was the best professional decision she made and would always be grateful and thankful for the guidance, encouragement, but more importantly, insistence on the part of Dean Cummins to take her to the path of medicine. Let's give Dean Cummins really a big round of applause. I think he's blushing today. Barbitians generally don't. But Dr. Cummins is following of this distinguished academic's career did not end there and encouraged her to consider joining the faculty and specifically at the School of Medicine as an adjunct faculty member under the guidance of Dr. Madan Rambaran and started to teach in the School of Medicine at that time. She's now the principal tutor of pediatrics and a lecturer in the postgraduate pediatrics program one of our affiliate programs. Dr. Aladdin has done several research pieces 
and has published a few scholarly articles. Her work was presented at both local and international conferences. She's a member of the editorial and organizing committee for the annual Guyana Medical Scientific Conference. But apart from this, she is actively involved in volunteer work and is an executive member of the Guyana Kidney Foundation and the Guyana Help the Kids Charity, among others. She's a mother, a lecturer, a researcher, a practice, practicing pediatrician, and a mentor. And as she traverses the intervening space between her chair to deliver this address, the other quality you will see was replicated in Shakespeare's work, Twelfth Night, when he said, and I quote, most radiant, exquisite, and unmatchable beauty. Please welcome our feature speaker to today's graduation exercise to deliver the feature dress. Let's get a bigger round of applause, please. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Registrar, Vice Chancellor, Pro Chancellor, other members of the stage, Director for the Burbies Campus, Deans, other faculty, administrative, and academic staff, special invitees, graduates of 2018, members of the media, members of the audience, members of the police force, a special good afternoon to you all. First of all, let me extend congratulations to the batch of 2018. Well done, you've made it. I stand here before you this evening to deliver a speech that is supposed to be motivational, inspirational, and real. So I decided to talk about me and my life. When I was a little girl, I had no dreams of attending a university. I didn't even know what a university was. All I knew was that I had to go to school, I had to pass every test, and it had to be first place. There was never any negotiation. Nothing else was acceptable in my house. As was said, I was born into a family of rice and cattle farmers for many generations, but they knew the value of education. What was most impactful in my life was that I had parents who knew the value and core principles in raising children. My mom ensured that we had everything needed for school, including home-cooked meals three times a day. We were well-fed. My dad, on the other hand, did one thing that made us all successful. He didn't do the homework, etc., but he rewarded us for our positions at the end of each term. We were given cash and gifts. So basically, at the beginning, I was paid to be smart. <laughs> Eventually, it became a norm, so I never settled for anything less. And of course, the money stopped flowing, but by then, the standard was already set. I was never ambitious as a child. In fact, I grew up in a village among cane cutters. I was also very gullible as a child and fascinated by this canvas water bottle that the cane cutters carried to work every day. So I asked my father for one. He told me that the only way I could get one is if I become a cane cutter. That's how you qualify for that bottle. So from then on, on my only goal in life was to cut cane. <laughs> they say aim for the stars and you'll fall in a cloud. For me, I started from the ground and worked my way up. Thank heavens, I got my very own canvas water bottle two birthdays ago from a very dear friend. So for me, dreams do come true. We had no phones and TV back in the days, in the 80s era. So I remembered when television came out, we begged my father to buy one. He was not a poor man, and he could have afforded it, but he didn't. Instead, he told my brother, who was writing Common Entrance that year, that if he did well, we would get a TV. Lo and behold, he topped Region 5, and we got a TV. There was only one channel, so we begged for a VCR. He refused to buy a VCR. My sister wrote Common Entrance the next year, and we got a VCR. 
My youngest sister got her very own BMX bike when she passed to go to, common to President's College from Common Entrance. That's how we got things as kids. My point is, nothing was given to us freely. We were made to earn everything as children. Not because my parents couldn't afford it, but because we were taught the value of working for your own. Hence, we valued everything we had. It is important that children are molded at a very young age to become productive members of society. What you teach and expose a child to in the first seven years of life will have the greatest impact on their lives, and this is scientifically proven by many researchers. Be examples. Remember that children look up to adults as role models. What we do affects the world. Always be accountable for your actions. Always ask yourself how your actions will impact the lives of those you love and care for. When you choose to do something, think of the greater good that will come for it. Never be selfish. Your greatest gift on this earth is to serve others. In service comes gratitude. My education in Barbies was in no way inferior to those of my colleagues from Georgetown. New Amsterdam Multilateral, and by extension, Barbies has produced many outstanding professionals who hold top positions in Guyana and in the wider world. Raise your heads up high as Barbicians and educated in Barbies. I do. There are many easier roads to medicine, but I'm glad that I took the longer one. I learned the discipline of professionalism being employed before I went into the medical school, and I developed relationships that have become so important to me now. This has made me much more mature as a medical student and as a doctor. Certain things cannot be shortchanged in life, like maturity. It does come with age and experiences. Medical school was no walk in the park. I attempted to quit several times. Every year at the end of the year, you're always asking yourself, do I really want to go through to this again and again and again? I had real books with pages. I didn't have a computer and I didn't have e-books then. Eventually, five years ended. I had minimal social life, but I graduated at the top of my class, gaining the valedictorian and the prime minister's medal, among others. So I decided, well, I've achieved enough. So I got married during my internship moved back to Burbies, and I decided to start a family instead of furthering my career. I worked at New Amsterdam Hospital during my pregnancy, after which I decided to quit my job and enjoy motherhood for a year. There is a time and place for everything, and we must learn to balance work and life. I'm glad that I was able to do that. However, my fairy tale of life was shattered in 2015. As a mother, as a wife, and as a best friend of 16 years, and most of all, as a doctor, I watched my husband walk into the emergency at Georgetown Hospital, and 20 minutes later being placed on life support. It was numbing to know that with all the knowledge, experiences, and resources accessible to me, he would die. I sat there, and while doubting it was happening, we organized a massive blood drive to save his life, he was A negative, and it was a three-day holiday weekend, so that didn't work well. I organized a medivac to the USA as a last resort, knowing that it was pointless. However, my consultant sat me down and said to me, your husband had 100% mortality, meaning nothing can be done to save him. I sat by his bedside, and I prayed that God take charge and do what was best for him, and within 20 minutes, his heart stopped, and I became widowed. One day prior to that, we were celebrating, we were planning our New Year's Eve celebration. You see, my husband had a degree in biology, also graduated from the University of Guyana, but his love was farming. We were all farmers. We had many decisions about moving away from farming when there was the bird flu outbreak, but we never did. Eventually, he died from leptospirosis, which was acquired on the farm. I thought of a million other ways that this could have turned out differently but there was only one ending. The days seemed endless, time stood still, the pain got worse, and no matter how I tried, I woke up every morning feeling the same deep, nagging, endless pain over and over and over. I knew what it was like, and I wished that I was better off dead sometimes because it will end my pain. I was angry at my dead husband for taking the easy way out and leaving me here to hurt this much, I was also angry at the world, and I was angry at God. 
All the love and support I had from my family and friends didn't help me much. I had counseling, but it was also the toughest time. I know what grief feels like, and there is no book or audio lecture that can prepare you for that. I was also five months away from writing my exam for my master's in pediatrics. I was an A student, and I was left now with my life in shambles, not knowing what would happen. I attempted to go to work every day, but I couldn't make it because my husband died where I worked. Just driving into the compound in the morning would lead me to a meltdown. My boss then was a pastor. He lent me his shoulders to cry on every day, and we prayed together. He kept telling me everything happens for a reason. He told me I would understand this someday, but just trust in God. I thought of taking a year off from studies, but then I realized that would just give me more idle time to be sad and depressed. So I picked myself up and went back to work. Every day was a little better. I decided that I will write the exam for him, and I will give it my best shot, so I started studying one month prior. What made the difference, however, was that I had completed all my program requirements in the first two years, so all I really needed to do was pass that exam. Being top of the game always works. Fast forward, the days got better, I wrote my exams, and I graduated for the third time from the University of Guyana with my master's in pediatrics, all the while working and raising my child now as a single mother. I prayed about it, and I began to see things differently. Subconsciously, I started to value things. My time was more precious now. I ensured that I spent it on the people and the things I love. My senses became heightened, and I was able to appreciate the little things like birds chirping or the colors of flowers when I walked by. And what was surprising to me was the music I listened to all my life had meaning now. What I summed up this transition to is something called gratitude. I became thankful for everything that has happened to me. I started talking about my husband without crying, and I smiled at his memories. I bragged about how blessed I am to have experienced unconditional love that people search for their whole lives. I started thanking God for bringing him into my life and for giving me my son Liam to complete me on this journey. I feel now that I'm the luckiest person alive. Coming out of a tragic loss and the worst depression, I became a better person, and I wouldn't change a thing. My experience has made me better in every aspect. I deal with death all the time at my work, but I never understood what it did to family. Now, when I tell families that their child will die or is dead, I can sit with them, and I can cry with them, and I can comfort them. And when they look at me and say, you don't understand, you're an average doctor, I smile because I understand everything. I have lived it. I am able to show empathy and compassion, and I'm able to counsel my patients and relatives better now. Throughout this journey, I have discovered that I am one amazing woman. I am unstoppable. I embark on tasks and I get them done 100% of the time. Every day people ask me, how do you do it? I teach, I work, I sit on research committee. I am an active researcher and I am a homemaker most of all. I pride myself in that. I have a son who eats curry chicken every day with roti. And he does not buy food from the school, so I have to make food every day for him. He has the stomach of a barbician farmer. <laughs> Today, I hold many roles and titles. I didn't let my circumstances define me. I didn't victimize myself for all that I went through. I hit rock bottom, and I know what that's like. So I appreciate happiness because I have been sad. I live by certain principles that has made me who I am, and I encourage you all today to develop and practice good habits. The famous Aristotle quote that the Vice Chancellor and I have in common. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. Start your day right. Get up early. Pray, meditate, exercise, drink a glass of water, and have a good breakfast. This sets the pace for a productive day. Make a to-do list and ensure that it is complete at the end of each day. Nothing spills over. I stay up late at night if I have to so that I can finish my to-do list. And these little habits have made the most difference. Surround yourself with good people. I have found out that people you interact with the most will have the greatest impact on your life. Always choose good company who will teach you something, who will make you better, who will influence you positively. 
Show me your friends and I will tell you who you are. My mom always said that to me and I understand that now. Find your rock and be a rock in someone else's life. My sister was my rock and always is. There are toxic people out there and we can't save them all. Know when to draw the line. Eleanor Roosevelt said, and I live by this, great minds discuss idea, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. This has been instrumental in me choosing my very close circle. One thing I'd like to encourage you to do is smile. Smile more often. Smiling makes us happy by releasing chemicals in the body that can combat stress. Smiling is also contagious and it's good for your facial muscles, so there's no harm in doing it. The Prophet Muhammad said, your smile for your brother is charity. Be confident. Know your worth. Too many times I see women put up with abuse just to accept it as a way of life. Remember that you must love yourself before you can give love to anyone else. Tell yourself that you're beautiful, you're smart, you're amazing, and you are blessed. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. I am often asked, why am I so confident in myself? And I say, why not? My parents bragged about my smarts and beauty as a child. I grew up with that confidence, and my husband encouraged it. And if I wasn't lucky enough, I have a son who is a real charmer. He says, Mommy, you're very cute. He reciprocates his father's trait, and I'm so lucky to have him. Children reciprocate what they see and what they experience. Let that be good for them. Don't expose them to negativity. Build their confidence from a young age. Tell them how much you love them, how proud you are of them, and how smart they are. Leanne discovered the Mohawk hairstyle in CPL this year from Emirate, watching cricket on TV. So the other day, he combed his hair and he said, Mom, I look like Emirate. And then he came back and he said, Actually, Mom, I look better than Emirate. I was like, that is confidence right there. <laughs> Learn to say okay or no to people when you have to. A close friend of mine taught me that I would be less stressed if I just said okay to many comments rather than reporting. Know which battles are worth fighting. I have fought too many battles. And I have developed the art of detecting those that are worth fighting and those that you should pass up. Listen to your instinct. It is always right, 100% of the time. I learned this the hard way, and now my gut feeling is most important. Don't take things personally, and don't have expectations. It took me a few books and many audio lectures to understand this concept, but I finally got it. When people do things, either good or bad, it reflects who they are as an individual and their personality. Remain indifferent and never have expectations. I have realized that expectation is the greatest cause of despair. Dream big. Go out there and have plans. Don't ever say it is impossible. Set goals and work towards them. Make a bucket list. Understand that your subconscious can work even though you are not working. Plant seeds in the universe. Energy is never destroyed, so your thoughts matter. After graduating for the third time from the University of Ghana in 2016, I told my family that I would not subject them to another graduation exercise unless I am faculty on stage. And that was my goal for sixth day. Here I am at 35, two years later giving my keynote, back on stage, wearing this gong for the fourth time now, and I am faculty. At 60, I am 35 now, so dream big. Lose yourself in service to this planet. Service is the most rewarding thing there is. Volunteer as much as you can. Help keep the environment clean. Plant a tree or your own garden. As Barbatians, we all have a garden, or we should have a garden. Do it for the love and not for the likes, as Chronic said, and I love that song. When people ask me why I'm still at Georgian Hospital all, after all these years, I say it's the most rewarding thing I can do with my life. I get to deliver care to the less fortunate children, and I get to teach medical students and mentor them at the same time. Remember to pass your knowledge on. It is because of great teachers like Dr. Dubey and Dr. Rambaran who molded me so that I can stand here today. Little things like helping the neighborhood kids with their homework and keeping lessons in the village will make a dramatic difference. 
You are soon going to be graduates. Carry yourself with dignity. Make the University of Guyana proud and make this country proud. When I'm asked by visiting professors from all over the world where I studied, I proudly say University of Guyana. Most of them are unaware that we have a postgraduate program. They're always impressed. Don't ever talk your institution down. It made you who you are. Volunteer and become teachers. It is a cycle and we have a duty to continue it. There is a saying, love what you do until you do what you love. Whenever you go into a new job, or embark on a journey, it may not be what you wanted or what you have expected, but always give it 100%. You will impress your leaders enough to take chances on you. If you're going to do it, do it right. One and other things that make you successful, things like traveling and reading. When you travel, you meet new people, you understand new cultures, and you open up your mind to new possibilities. Explore Guyana and the wider world. I know there are many Guyanese who would have traveled to the U.S. and to Canada, but have never seen Kaitro Falls, much less the Rupununis or Leguan. So learn your country. Don't save all your money. Live. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. Read. It sharpens your vocabulary and your knowledge, and it helps you answer a lot of Jeopardy questions. Become readers and see how it will transform you. The last book I read was The Alchemist, and it was, a it was a truly breathtaking experience. My most important lesson that I have learned at this stage of my life from all of my cumulative experiences is to be grateful. Be full of gratitude. I listen to Joel Austin on my way to work every morning, and it sets my day. Be thankful and never complain about how bad things are. Look at your glass half full instead of half empty. Be an optimist and not a pessimist. Be thankful for your life because many others didn't make it this far. Be thankful for your family. You're stuck with them for a life. So love them unconditionally. Be thankful for the food and other necessities that you have that others may lack. Be thankful that you live in Guyana where there's no natural disaster. We have amazing weather and we have bountiful resources. And remember that things can only get better. It always does. Never doubt anything in your life. Everything happens for a reason and to teach us something. Always ask yourself, what is this trying to teach me? What did I learn from this experience? Go forth and make us proud. Make yourself proud. Make your family proud. And make the university proud. But most of all, make Guyana proud. I take pride in being Guyanese. I take pride in the education I received from the University of Guyana. Everything that I have achieved was because of hard work and commitment, and I enjoy a good quality of life in Guyana. It can be quite frustrating at times, and life is not a bed of roses. It is what you make of it. You are the author, so don't let anyone else write your story. I have learned that you have to have high standards. You have to maintain high standards and consistency in every aspect of your life. You cannot separate it. Malcolm X said, if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. Stand for something. My charge for you today is to lose yourself in service to the soil. Martin Luther King Jr. said, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Congratulations, and I thank you. We sincerely thank Dr. Bibi Aladdin for such a personal story and such an insightful charge. The Guyana Police Force Band will now do a musical rendition entitled New Day and the arranger Joan Jilks. Let's welcome them appropriately, please, with a big round of applause.
Thank you very much. Pro Chancellor, allow me to request of the Vice Chancellor the opportunity to present to our feature speaker, Dr. Aladdin, a token of the university's appreciation on behalf of all of us at the University of Ghana. <coughs> Very often at graduation ceremonies, there are wonderful words voiced by speakers. Most graduation ceremonies, people tend to forget who the graduation speaker is because invariably the speakers do not speak their personal stories. Personal stories as in the case of Dr. Bibi Aladdin, there are not only lessons for her, inspiration from her, but lessons that each of us, graduating and non-graduating, can find as we go the rest of our physical, professional, and other journeys. I deem it a wonderful opportunity to, on behalf of the university, thank Dr. Aladdin not only for accepting my invitation, but for using her personal story as an inspirational one, as a motivation with words of wisdom. Many of us in this place can identify, and I want to commend to you when we shall have published her speech, get a copy and share it with somebody else. And so, Pro Chancellor, let me on behalf of the university read to you this small token of appreciation that says, University of Guyana, with the deepest appreciation, Dr. Bibi Aladdin Karan. Keynote speaker, 17th Convocation, University of Guyana, Burbies Campus. We thank you for your generous commitment of time. It was an honor to have you deliver the feature address this 17th day of November, a Saturday, Burbies, Guyana. <laughs> 